This lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about visualizing rings or how to draw pictures of them. So there are sort of three ways to draw a picture of a ring. We can draw a point of a picture for each um, element of the ring. Or we can draw a point for each basis element if the ring is some vector space, or we can draw a point for each prime ideal. And this lecture, we're going to be discussing the first method where we draw a point for each element of the ring. Um, so there are some examples of these we've had before. For example, if we've got the ring of real numbers, then of course we just draw it as a line with a point for each real number. If we've got the ring of complex numbers, we can draw it as a plane with points 0, 1, i, and so on. And if we've got the integers, we can think of it as being a subset of the reals of points 0, 1, 2, and so on. And what we're going to do is to um, find a few more examples like this. Um, so the first example is the ring of Gaussian integers. And the ring of Gaussian integers is contained in the complex numbers, and so we can just draw it as a square lattice. So we have the point 0, 1, 2, and then we get i, i plus 1, and so on. Um, so, um, as an application of this, we will show that this ring is a unique factorization domain. So to do this, we'll just review Euclidean domains. So we recall a Euclidean domain is an integral domain R with the division with remainder algorithm. What this means is if we're given um, A and B in R with B not equal zero, it's probably not a good idea to divide by zero, then A is equal to QB plus R, where this is the quotient and this is the remainder. And the key point is that, the, that R is smaller than B. Well, what do we mean by the absolute value of an element of a ring? Well, we have a map from the ring to some well-ordered set, such as the non-negative integers, um, which just takes any element R to some element of this set denoted by its absolute value. So for the integers, we can just take the usual absolute value and so on. Um, and now um, we recall that a Euclidean ring is a principal ideal domain um, which is PID for short because it's a bit a lot much to write out and principal ideal domain has unique factorization into primes. So We'll just very quickly recall the proofs of these. So, for instance, if we want to show that Euclid implies it's a principal ideal domain, what we do is we pick an, um, an ideal i in R, and if i is not equal to the zero ideal, pick a in i with a minimal given that a is not zero. And then we can check that i is generated by the element a, so is principal. And if we take b in i, then we can write b is equal to a times q plus r with r less than a, r in i, so r 
So R equals zero because A was minimal. So all, um, all uh, ideals in a Euclidean ring are principal. Um, also, um, we can show that principal ideal domains are unique factorization domains. And here we have the following key point. If P is irreducible, so this means P is not zero or a unit, and if P equals A, B, then A or B is a unit, then P is prime. So this means P is not zero or a unit, and if P divides A, B, then P divides A or P divides B. So the vertical line here means the left-hand side divides the right-hand side. Um, so sometimes primes are divided, defined by this property, but usually in commutative, sorry, primes are often defined by this property here, but usually in commutative algebra, this property is referred to as being irreducible and being prime is referred to as this property. For the integers, these two conditions are the same, so it doesn't matter. And the proof of this is again very easy. All you do is um, say, um, suppose P divides A, B. If P does not divide A, then we look at the ideal generated by P and A, which must be the ideal generated by x for some element x because it's a principal ideal domain. Um, so um, x divides p, so x must either be, um, since, since p is irreducible, x must either be a unit times p or must be a unit but it can't be a unit times P because P does not divide A. So X is a unit. So P A is the ideal generated by one. So this means X times P plus Y times A equals one for some X Y. And if we multiply by B, we find X P B plus Y A B equals b. And this is divisible by p because p divides a, b, so p divides b. So we've shown that if p does not divide a, it must divide b, so p is prime. And now from this, this easily implies unique factorization into primes. And I'll just give the, the key step of this. All we do is we say if P1, P2, and so on is equal to Q1, Q2, and so on, with all the PI and QI irreducibles, then P1 divides Q1, Q2, and so on. So P1 divides some QI, by what we've just shown, that if, if an irreducible divides a product of numbers, it must divide one of them. Um, so P1 must be equal to QI times a unit. And now we can remove P1 and QI from both factorizations and continue like that. And we find the two factorizations must be the same, up to units and change of order, of course. Um, so, we have shown that Euclidean domains are unique factorization domains. Now what we want to do is to show that Z of I is Euclidean. So in particular, it's a unique factorization domain. And what we want to do is to show that if A and B are in Z I, with B not equal to zero, then we can find Q and R with um, 
with, with this property here. Here we're going to take um, R to be the complex absolute value Or, well, the, the complex absolute value isn't actually an integer, but it's given by the square root of m squared plus n squared if r is equal to m plus n i, which is equal to the square root of an integer. And square roots of integers are also well ordered. So this is just as good as it being an integer. Um, you could, if, if, you're, if you really want the this to be an integer, you could just take it be the square of the usual absolute value. It doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. Um, so we've got to find Q and R with this property. And now let's just divide by B. We've got to say A over B is equal to Q plus R over B. Um, and now we want R over B to have absolute value less than one. In other words, R is less than the absolute value of B. So this number here is in ZI. And what this is saying, uh, we want to show that any A over B is equal to something in ZI, that would be Q plus something with absolute value less than one. So this would be the R over B. And um, so let's draw a picture of this. So here are the elements of Z of I. So and now let's draw all things that are within distance one of some element of, of, of Z of I. Well, all that means is you draw a circle of radius one around each lattice point. And we notice that these unit circles so the unit circles of radius one, I guess I ought to call them disks rather than circles because they're solid, cover the complex plane. I should say these are the open unit disks of radius one. Um, so, uh, uh, so since these disks cover the plane, every complex number can be written as something in Z of I plus something of absolute value less than one. Um, so Z of I is Euclidean. So we've got a very geometric picture of Z of I being Euclidean. It's just saying that the um, plane is covered by open unit disks like this. Um, well, we can extend this argument Suppose we look at z of root minus two and draw a picture of it. Well, here we, we sort of get rectangles. So here's naught one, here's root minus two and so on. And again, if we draw um, a unit circle around each point, then you can see that these unit circles still cover the plane. So unit circles, so unit disks still cover the plane. So Z root minus two is also a unique factorization domain. These are the open ones. Well, now let's move on to Z root minus three and see what happens. So if we take z root minus 3, then we get these points 1, 0, 1, root minus 3, 1 plus root minus 3. And now something a little bit different happens, because if you draw the um, uh, 
So that should have gone through there. If you draw the open discs around each point, then there's a point here that they don't quite cover. So, so this point here is the point 1 plus root minus 3 over 2. And it is distance 1 from all these points, 0, 1, root minus 3, 1 plus root minus 3. So the previous argument fails, and it's not clear that this ring is Euclidean. Um, in fact, it's not Euclidean. So z root minus 3 is not Euclidean. It's not Euclidean for um, any absolute value. I mean, we, we, we've, we've shown it's not Euclidean for one particular absolute value, but maybe there's another clever thing we could define that made it Euclidean. Well, that fails because it's not Euclidean. It's not a principal ideal domain. And it's not a unique factorization domain. If you want to see it's not a unique factorization domain, you just notice that 2 times 2 is equal to 1 plus root minus 3 times 1 minus root minus 3. And this gives two different factorizations of 4, and these don't differ by units or anything else. Um, we can also see directly that it's not a principal ideal domain. Well, let's see an example of a non-principal ideal. Well, a non-principal ideal is the ideal generated by 2 and 1 plus root minus 3. And to see this as non-principal, the easiest way is to draw a picture of it. So let's draw the um, ring. And now you notice the ring is sort of rectangular. So the black dots is just the principal ideal one, which is all things of the form m plus n root minus 3. Um, so here's naught 1, here's root minus 3. And now I want to draw the ideal generated by 2 and 1 plus root minus 3. And if you draw this ideal, you get all these points here, and you can easily check this is an ideal. And now these points here, if you join them up, they form a nice triangular lattice, you see, like this, and cover the plane with equilateral triangles. Um, so you can think of this as being a triangular lattice. with equilateral triangles. On the other hand, if you look at the principal ideal, it's a sort of rectangular lattice. You know, if I join the top points up like this, I'm getting a lot of rectangles. And um, any other principal ideal has to be of the form A times R and is also a rectangular lattice. That's because if we multiply by some complex number, that corresponds to rotating by the argument of the complex number and rescaling by the absolute value of the complex number. So if you take this lattice and multiply it by A, you'll get some sort of rescaled and rotated rectangular lattice. You might get a lattice looking something like that. But it will always kind of look rectangular, and it will never look like a bunch of equilateral triangles. So this ideal is non-principal because it, it, it's, it's sort of a different shape from the principal ideal in some sense. So you can visibly see this ideal is non-principal just by drawing a picture of it. Um, um, however, we can modify this result because we can replace the ring z root minus 3 by the ring z 1 plus root minus 3 over 2. And this is still a ring. If we call this element omega, then we know omega squared plus omega plus 1 is equal to naught. So this ring is just everything of the form m plus n omega. And because 
omega squared is a linear combination of these. This is indeed a ring. And now if we draw a picture of this ring, we now get a triangular lattice. And now if we draw unit circles around each of these points, these obviously cover the plane. So unit, the, the unit disks are covering the plane. So Z one plus root minus three over two is Euclidean and a unique factorization domain and so on. Um, so, um, um, so this gives a method of giving geometric proofs that various rings are Euclidean and therefore unique factorization domains. I should comment that Euclidean domains are actually rather rare, even among unique factorization domains. For example, um, you may or may not remember that the ring of polynomials is a unique factorization domain if R is a unique factorization domain. So in particular, if you've got a field, the field of polynomials in several variables is a unique factorization domain, but it's not a principal ideal domain. For example, the ideal generated by x, y is not principal. So Euclidean domains are only very special sorts of unique factorization domains. Um, you can also ask, are, are all principal ideal domains Euclidean domains? Um, but the answer is most principal ideal domains in practice are Euclidean. So this includes things like Z, the ring of polynomials over a field, discrete valuation rings that we'll talk about later, and the Gaussian integers. In fact, it's quite difficult to find an example of a principal ideal domain that isn't Euclidean. Um, the simplest example I know of is the ring Z, one plus root minus 19 over two. So this is a principal ideal domain, but it's not Euclidean. If you want to see it's a principal ideal domain, you go to an algebraic number theory course. Um, if you want to see it's not Euclidean, you can, you can show this as follows. So if R is Euclidean, what we do is we let A be the smallest um, element with A not equal to zero, A not equal to a unit. Um, then every element of R over A is represented by zero or a unit by the division with remainder algorithm. However, the ring Z one plus root minus 19 over two has only two units, plus or minus one. So um, any quotient, the quotient by this minimal element must have at most three elements. However, you can easily check that every quotient of the ring by some, this ring by some element is either the zero ring with no elements or has at least four elements. The quotient by two has exactly four elements and it's got no quotient by three elements. So this ring can't be Euclidean no matter what sort of absolute value you put on it. I mean, I'm not saying you, I'm saying it's, um, you, you, you might find some absolute value other than the obvious one where you take the absolute value for a complex number. Even for some other absolute value, this isn't going to be Euclidean. Um, so this method of drawing pictures of a ring by drawing a point for each element works fine for rings whose additive group 
can be embedded in a vector space. So this applies to rings of integers of algebraic number fields and is very useful in algebraic number theory. For example, you can use it to prove Minkowski's theorem that the ideal class group of the ring of integers of an algebraic number field is finite. However, there are, apart from rings of integers of algebraic number fields, there aren't really very many rings which can be embedded in finite dimensional Euclidean spaces. So this method of drawing pictures of rings is very powerful when it works, but doesn't work for most rings. So next lecture, we will discuss another method of drawing pictures of rings, where you draw a picture of the basis of the ring over some field.